So, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here in, in India and in New Delhi. So, I've never been here before, so for me it's a big adventure. Uh, and I was asked to give a, a presentation on the technical aspects of doing cystectomy and intracorporeal urinary diversion. Uh, this is a rather complicated operation to do. Um, so, I, but I, so what I've done is I've done a video-based lecture, basically. So I will go through all the steps of how you do the operation. Uh, both male and female cystectomy and also how you do the urinary diversion. And hopefully it will be done in 30 minutes. That's at least the plan. Depends on if, you, if you have questions, I'm happy to take questions during the talk if you have any questions, okay? Uh, so, uh, to be a successful robotic surgeon, you have to be able to standardize the procedure. And as to, in urology, you know, the most common procedure is, of course, prostatectomy. And that is a procedure that, when you get trained, it takes around an hour to do. And it maybe is like seven or eight different steps of the procedure. When you talk about the cystectomy and a lymphadenectomy and a urinary diversion, we are talking about 45 or 50 different surgical steps. So the most complex part of this operation is actually to get all the steps together. But we try to standardize every step and do exactly the same operation over and over and over again. And that is the way to go forward and to do this as a very fast and simple operation. So first, uh, we always dissect the ureters, and then we do a posterior dissection, go lateral, take down the bladder, and do the apical dissection. And we try to do it exactly the same way. With the robot, there is an advantage, is that, and that is that you, can, you will see things. If you look at this, the image here, so you see the, the bladder is number six, and here you see the prostate, and all the jello is basically the nerves going down on the side. And when you work with the robot, the, the main advantage is that you will see the small anatomical details, of course, and you can avoid cutting these nerves. You, we do. So here you see the, the pelvic plexus on the side. Here you see the seminal vesicles. Here you see the prostate and the bladder. And you can understand that it's very easy to damage this plexus when you do a cystectomy. It's not only when you do a prostatectomy that when the nerves come down here, but also at this level it's easy to damage the nerves. Uh, and when we do a, a cystectomy, the standard cystectomy at Karolinska is now the nerve-sparing cystectomy. So most of the males that we operate will have a, a nerve-sparing, a potency uh, uh, preservation while doing a cystectomy. And that's one of the advantages of the robot is that you can go very, very close to the prostatic capsule. These patients don't have prostate cancer, so you can be very close <coughs> without having a, a, a big risk. So, so in, in Stockholm, 48% of all the patients that you have uh, for a cystectomy will actually have a prostate cancer, but most of them will have a very uh, low-risk prostate cancer. It doesn't matter if you go very close. And we have in, in our series now, which is something like 500 cystectomies, there is not even one biochemical recurrence, even if we do most of our prostatectomy in this fashion. Another thing is, of course, that when you do robotics, you will going to be a slave under your port placement. So if you're not very careful how you place your port, you will, have a, you will struggle. Especially when you do an operation like a cystectomy and urinary diversion where you need to be in different areas of the abdomen. Uh, but I, I, so when we do the, the, the operation now, we start with to, to put the ports relatively high up. You see, we, the camera port is like five, six centimeters above the umbilicus and all the ports are high up, and that is to be able to go down and also work here in this right quadrant where you will have to do quite a lot of the work for the urinary diversion. So the first step of this procedure is just freeing the ureters, and this is of course not very complicated to do. I think it's a good way to start because once you have dissected the ureters, uh, you set you up a little bit for the lymph node dissection, and you set up yourself a little bit also for the cystectomy. The important thing here is, of course, to have uh, uh, the proper instruments. We use five instruments. I know that cost is an issue also in India. We try to use as few robotics in instruments as possible. So we use one needle driver, one Maryland, and one scissors. And then we use one grasping instrument for the bowel, basically. You have, you have, you have robotic so we have, so we use forearms. So, 
And that's one of the important things here. To be able to do a cystectomy nicely, it's much better to use forearms. We put the clip, and you see that there is a suture in the clip here, and that is for us to be able to handle the, the ureters. So I will go. So this is basically the right side, and then you do the same thing on, on the, the left side, of course. And then we go to the posterior dissection. So after having done the ureters right and left, we start under the bladder. And this is, would be very similar to what we do when we do a, a prostatectomy, if you do the posterior approach. You will see the seminal vesicle and the vas deferens coming here. And this part of the operation is much easier to do while the bladder is still attached. If you take the bladder down first and then you try to go under the bladder, it's much more complicated, especially if you have a fat patient. Here you see the seminal vesicles. This is the tip of the right. And what we use the tip of the seminal vesicles for our aiming points. So when we do a cystectomy, we aim to go to the tip. Because if you go below the tip, you will go into the nerves, which means that you will damage the erectile function of the patient. Here you see the tip on the left side. And then you try to go through the denomius fascia here and go all the way down to the apex almost, as far down as you can. Depends on how fat the patient is. And probably that's a bigger problem in, in the United States or the UK rather than Sweden. Most people are not so fat. And also in India, I don't think you will have a big problem here. So you go all the way down to the apex. And then you start with the actual cystectomy going on the lateral side. So you go lateral to the umbilical ligaments. You start to go down. You, you, your aiming point is to go down to the endopelvic fascia. So you go all the way down here. And here you see the endopelvic fascia. And you will open the endopelvic fascia so you see the prostates. And now you have your posterior plane and your anterior plane. So now it's basically just to go between here. And we use the ligature. You can use a lot of different instruments here. Uh, this is also for, for, for cost, of course, you can do this cheaper. Uh, I don't personally like to use the, the stapler because the stapler is quite big and I don't think that you can have a perfect anatomical view when you use the stapler. But when you get close to the tip of the seminal vesicle, we start to use the clips because here we get into the nerve sparing part of the operation. And you can see that you can follow nicely. You can have the neurovascular bundle down here. And you see here's the seminal vesicle. So we just follow the, the, the border of the seminal vesicle. You see the prostate here. You know that the neurovascular bundle is coming just on the dorsolateral side of the, of the prostate. So this part of the operation is very similar to a prostatectomy. You, you open the fascia of the prostate and you will want to go in so you get into the grade one or intrafascial nerve sparing pain. You want to get close, close to the prostate and to pull the bundle down like this. In fact, when we look at our outcomes, the, the, the potency outcome in our cystectomy series is actually better than in our prostatectomy because we can go so close to the prostate here. So, and to do a non uh, a non nerve pain cystectomy is done in men who are not potent or uh, where the tumor is too aggressive to do a, this type of dissection. Now then you go from the right and you do the same thing on the left side, of course. But then you take the bladder down and you end up doing the, the, the apical dissection. And this is also relatively similar to what you do when you do a prostatectomy. The only thing here is, of course, that uh, the, you don't have a tumor at the apex, so you can actually be a little bit closer to the prostate to spare as much as possible of the urethra, because the more urethra you spare, the better chance of, of uh, continence for the patient. So you want to be close, close to the prostate here and to, to spare as much as urethra as possible, because the Every millimeter counts. So it's the same as for prostate 
surgery, but we move, you move around from the right to left and all the way around so that you free the urethra all around the prostate like this. So then you'll have a very nice urethral stump and you'll have a high chance of having a continent patient. So the, the continence is more than 90% now when you do a dissection like this. Daytime continence, Night, nighttime continence is different. But you see here we have nice neurovascular bundles coming down on each side. You will get the long urethra. And we open the urethra. This is an, an, a, a question of debate how you should take care of this. I do this exactly as I do in open. I'm not a believer in the discussion about seeding that would be increased in robotics or laparoscopic surgery. We don't see, we have done this operations in 2003 in Karolinska and we haven't seen any evidence of tumor seeding or anything like that. So instead of pulling the catheter down and clipping the urethra, because if you clip the urethra you will actually lose part of the length of the urethra and I don't think that's a good idea. You want to have as long as possible urethral stump. And here we take a frozen section from the urethra for pathology. And then we cut. Okay. And then we suture the dorsal venous complex. So next, that's the male cystectomy. So that's the first part of the operation. The female cystectomy is slightly different. We do use, you will see that we try to do a very similar type of operation. You can, in, 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 uh, in females, you can do different types of cystectomies. Here you will see the standard cystectomy when you take out the, the female uh, organs also, so the uterus and the ovaries. Start exactly the same way as in the male. So we start dissecting the ureters. Start on the right side. Why do you always start on the right side? Because the sigma is, is attached on the left, and it's actually, in most patients, hold to the left already when you start. So you actually have already a grasper holding the covalent to the left when you start the operation. So that's better to start on the right side. It's quicker to do. So you want to have a little bit of periuretaric tissue. You don't want to have too much because you don't want to, have to, to spare any tumor, but you want to have enough to have a good uh, length of the uh, ureter and to have good vascularization. Yeah, so next we do posterior dissection. You remember in the, ma in the male we went under the prostate. Here we instead will open the vagina and this is to have an aiming point. So you see we go into the posterior vagina and we open it. And then we basically have our aiming point because when we come from the lateral side, we, we will end in this hole basically. If you want to do an organ sparing, of course you do this differently, then you go on the other side of the uterus. But most of our patients will have tumors so that you want to take the, uh, the female organs out and also the urethra out. Looking at the lateral dissection in female is different from the male because the, the female, of course, they have the, the ovaries, so you have to start taking the, the ovarian vessels. And the other thing is that the, the female bladder is much broader than the male bladder, so you have to find a slightly different plane of dissection. But we use the same type of instruments here. So we use the ligature in most patients here. So slim patients, you don't even need the ligature almost. You will see it a little bit later. It comes. So you see, you, go, you want to go lateral to the umbilical ligament. You basically develop the same plane as in the male. So lateral to umbilical ligament down to the uh, endopelvic fascia. You will not open the endopelvic fascia in females because you want to spare all the nerves. All the nerves coming to the vagina come from the lateral side in, so you want to spare as much of these nerves as possible. But you go down to the endopelvic fascia. It looks almost like a prostatectomy. And then you see the vest. This is the umbilical ligament, so we put a clip on the umbilical ligament. 
And then we have our aiming point down here, the opening of the vagina. So we will now go to aim to go down. And if you set yourself up, this is a relatively easy part of the operation. And then the important thing here is not because the bladder sits more lateral like this in females, which means that you have to go a little bit lateral. And you want to take the, the bladder and the part of the anterior vagina. We, as you see, we use the ligature here. It's a very nice instrument, I think, to use. And now you just go on the side, so you lift the anterior part of the vagina up. Then you go to the other side. We don't have to see this. So we have done now the left, the right, and the, did the left also, and then at the end we will need to do the the apical dissection. So here we are on the left side. You see the anterior vagina and the urethra is coming up, and now we go from the top. This is the last part you do with the bladder. The bladder is still hanging up there, which means that it's easier to work. And then we will come down to do the apical part. At this point, the, the, most of the vagina is, is open. So here you see, it looks like puberprostatic ligaments, but they are female, so they are not puberprostatic. I don't remember the name. Do anybody remember the name of these ligaments in females? Ah, okay. No, we'll do other dissection because we'll have to spare the urethra. So we will leave the whole anterior, of course, the, the whole uh, anterior part of the vagina. So you have to do that slightly different. This is more the standard type of cystectomy. We don't do that many uh, neobladders in females because we have more issues with continence in females than in males, of course, and, and I think it's very nice operation for males continent neobladders, but not as not as nice in females. You have both hypercontinence and incontinence as a problem. And then you cut the urethra like this. And then you can pull the, the specimen out through the vagina and close the vagina. So also, this is relatively easy to do, and at this point, then you just close the vagina, basically. So now, I will not show you any video of the lymph node dissection, because it's basically the same lymph node dissection as we do in, in uh, prostate cancer, but we go a little bit higher. Come to the more complicated part of this procedure is the the urinary diversion. This is the part of the operation that will give you uh, the, the bigger problem. Uh, because here is the, this is the part of the operation that gives the patients almost all the complications that you find after cystectomy are from the urinary diversion. So we are doing intracorporeal work. If you want to do a robotic operation, you want to finish the whole operation with the robot or at least in a minimal invasive manner. You don't want to open the patients halfway through a robotic operation and have it like a, a, a hybrid operation because many of the aspects of doing a robotic operation is lost or a minimal invasive operation, of course. I know that you can uh, do mini laparotomy and so on and do the, this as an open operation with a small incision. But, but if you want to do a minimal invasive operation, I think you should try to do it. We are doing... Um, I will show you a video of the continent the neobladder here. Uh, something like 40% of the patients in Karolinska that where we do cystectomy will have a neobladder, the others will have a conduit. Depending on age, patient preference, and disease, and so on, that will decide. Uh, 
If you do a, a, a neobladder, I think it's important to do a spheric neobladder. So we are trying to do a spheric, not just the tubular one. You know that for volume pressure relationship, it's better to have a sphere than to have a cylinder. So we are trying to do a Stude type of neobladder. If you look at the Stude neobladder, uh, he will isolate a little bit more than 50 centimeter of intestine. He will open 40 centimeter, do the posterior, fold it, do half of the anterior, do the anastomosis. And if you look at the anastomosis, the anastomosis will be here at this position, which means that you have an anastomosis which is 10 centimeter from this end. So 10 centimeter, and then you have 30 centimeter plus the chimney on the other side. So when we start this, we start with the anastomosis. So we start here. Before we had done anything of this, we take the intestine down and we make the anastomosis. So, but when we start to isolate the intestine then, when we staple it, you will see that we staple 10 centimeter distal to the anastomosis and 40 centimeter proximal to the anastomosis. So there will be very different in this length of the intestine on the right and left side of the anastomosis. And that is because we want to make the same thing here. So we want to do a post anastomosis, open it, the anastomosis will be here. Do a posterior suturing like this and then fold it like this and do basically the same operation. So it looks like this when we do it. We'll bring the, the ileum down, do the anastomosis here. We will staple 10 centimeters here. We will have 45 or something on this side. We will do the posterior. This is not correct because the posterior will actually be a little bit like this because there is more intestine on this side. So it will be like a dog ear almost on this side. Oof. And then we fold the, this part to a position which is like 10 centimeter proximal here. And then close half of this, put up the stents, and then in the end close everything. So it's very similar to Stude, but we do it in a different order. And we end up with the spheric neobladder. So first, not to forget, pull the left ureter over to the right side. Sometimes I forget this, and then you have a big problem, because it's not so easy once you have pulled the intestine down and started the neobladder to go under and take the left ureter. But if you do a good lymph node dissection all the way up to the aortic pacification, as we do in all our patients, it's very easy to pull the ureter across. Uh, so doing the anastomosis, which would be the first part of the operation, is in most patients not very complicated. In females, it's basically all, never complicated because it's easy to get the intestine down. In some males, it's sometimes a problem to get the intestine down because they have a short mesentery. This is also something that you see mostly in short and fat males. <clears throat> and there are some tricks to do if you have this problem, but here you see that my fourth arm is holding the intestine down. We are doing a posterior reconstruction here. So the first is to take, this is denon vias fascia, almost like a Rocco suture. And this is the urethra or the denon vias fascia just under the urethra. And here you see that we're even having the peritoneum. So we pull this together and that is to pull the urethra inside basically. This is also to take some, some pressure of the anastomosis. And once you have done this, you, have, you see the, the peritoneum comes down, the, the non-vious fascia come up. We can take the intestine and we just suture the posterior side of the intestine down in the second layer. So this would be very much like what we do when we do a, a, a posterior reconstruction in the prostate. You pull the bladder down. First you pull the de vias fascia and then you pull the bladder down. And then you can do your anastomosis without a lot of tension. So here, you know, I just basically fix the intestine down. And after you do this, you, can, you open the intestine. So at this point, it's only the ileum that is pushed down in the pelvis and sutured to the urethra. So we haven't done any stapling or anything like that. So it's straightforward intestine down. And here we do an anastomosis, which is almost exactly like a Van Velthofen. So we double needle go on each side up like this. Most patients, this is not so complicated. It can be more complicated when you have a lot of tension. But this is 
small opening here in the intestine. And the patient will only have one shot of antibiotics before surgery and nothing more if they don't have an infection, of course. And we have found that when, when we start, when we, the less antibiotics we give, and this is the situation in Stockholm, I don't know how it is in India, but in Stockholm it is, the less antibiotics we give, the less infections problem we have for the patient. But this might be different in different areas. So we don't do anything like this. You can, but it's, it's usually not a problem with the intestine. It's, if there is a problem to get the, the tissue down, it's almost always uh, because of short mesentery. And then you have to incise the peritoneum and you have to do perineal pressure and you can reduce the delivery. Uh, so I will pass this going, going to the next part. So at this point, we now have the anastomosis done. And we want to isolate the intestine. And here you see a nice instrument, which is a bowel <laughs> grasping instrument, which you can actually use to grab the bowel without having a trauma to the bowel. We use one of these. This instrument is not the pro-grasp. This is a cadier's forceps. And the cadier forceps has much, much less grasping force than the, than the, the pro-grasp because you want to have gentle instrument. And here with the staple intestine, and you can see that the stapler will only go like two to three centimeters into the mesentery. So you never go deep into the mesentery. You never have a problem with the circulation. So the first stapler was 10 centimeter uh, distal, and this one is like 40 centimeter proximal to the anastomosis. And you again see that the stapler goes only a few centimeters. This is 60. So like two, three centimeters into the mesentery. So next, so once you have stapled, now you have basically isolated intestine, but you have to, to uh, have a continu continuation of the ileum again, back to the distal part. So here we just open it. And if you now come with your stapler from the fourth arm, so we have the fourth arm in, the fourth robotic arms come in a 15 millimeter port on the left side. And then the stapler will come in very nicely in that it will have a perfect angle to do the stapling. So this first is a 60 millimeter stapler. anti -mesentrally. and And if the Staple comes in the right angle. This is very easy to do. And we use one extra staple because I want to have more than 60. So this is a 45. So I do first a 60 and then a 45 millimeter stapling. And that is just to be sure that you have a long anastomosis here so you don't have any uh, relative uh, ileus or anything like this. or. or, or problem and then you end up, if you have a long anastomosis here, you can actually go down with this so that you are well aware of any damaged part of the intestine here when you do your stapling. So now then we have isolated our intestine and we want to detuberize it. And now you understand that there's a lot of steps because now is the time when you get a little bit tired, especially in the beginning when this operation takes six or seven or even eight hours when you do this the first time. For us now, the typical time to do the whole procedure is now something like four hours. We are having the same time as we have in our open cases. So here we just open. This is, we don't have to spend time looking at this. Just, you just do an anti mesenteria opening. And now, once you have done this, you have to suture the posterior part because now we have opened the whole reservoir 10 centimeter plus 30, and you leave a little bit for the chimney. And <clears throat> we put some stay sutures here because you see that now it becomes not so easy to understand exactly what you're doing here. So you have to be careful. We have a stay suture on this side. So this holds the serosa the most, 
this is the part that's going to be folded down to a point which is 10 centimeter on this side. So you see we have a suture here. This is the stay suture, which is at the dog ear, basically. So there is, will be like three or four stay sutures holding this posterior suture line. And the important thing here is that you put them serosa to serosa, because if you do that, you can line up everything nicely, and it becomes very easy to suture. So here now, your assistance is pulling pulling the stay suture in this direction. The fourth arm is pulling the stay suture in this direction. And then you have a nice uh, suture line to follow. And as you see, this is something which is relatively easy to do with robots. If you do this by hand, you have to be a very skilled laparoscopist to do this. And we use this barbed suture here because it's much faster. I don't like the barbed sutures when you have tension, but if you suture things without a lot of tension, it's actually quite nice. You see nicely the catheter comes in through the anastomosis here, and you, have, you can see everything nicely. So, and you will go all the way down, and you will end up out here, basically. So, next is the folding. So once you have done the posterior, you want to fold. And now you want to fold this. Now you create your sphere. So you don't just close this side to this side here like a cylinder. You actually take the, the, this, the midline of your posterior line and you fold it to a position which is 10 centimeter proximal to the anastomosis. And this is what makes this a, a more spheric and a more Struder type of neobladder rather than just to have a, a cylinder. And at this point, you basically close half of the, exactly like Struder is doing before his anastomosis, it, class, it closes half of the neobladder and push it down to the urethra and do his anastomosis. But we have already done the anastomosis here. But you can see nicely, here's the one side of the nail bladder, and this is the other side, and it will come down nicely to, towards the anatomosis. And now then we'll come to the last part, basically, of this procedure, and that is to how you connect your ureters. And we will do a Wallace plate. You can do this in different ways. We always do a Wallace plate, and we first do the, the suture here, and then you take the intestine, you put your stents, and then you take your intestine, the, the chimney of the extruder, and suture towards the Wallace plate. So here now, you see one of the advantages of doing intracorporeal work. You can start your incision in the ureter five centimeters down on the left and the right, which means that you don't have to have a very long ureter to do this. And one of the issues doing this type of procedure is, of course, that you may have strictures. And if you, if you can cut away the last, the, the, the distal part of the ureter, the, the risk of a devascular ureter is much less. And you want to try to do a non-touch technique. So the, the less you touch the ureters here, the better it is. So this is a 5-0 suture, monofilament. And this would be at least two and a half centimeter or something. So once you have done this, now you put the stents in. And the stents will come down here with the cell linear technique. So this is a, a needle. This is a, the same needle as the anesthesia. It's, just, it's, a, it's a Venflon catheter, basically, the largest we have. And the, that is used to push the guide wire and then the stent. And Unfortunately, all of these different steps is what makes the operation difficult, and you cannot uh, afford to have uh, any mishappenings. And at this point now, you have a Wallace plate here, you have your right ureter coming here, your left ureter here, you hold everything up here with your fourth arm, and now you can suture the chimney of the Studer.
何十So you start the anterior side and then you can do the posterior side by turning, flipping everything. You see nicely both sides when you do this. That should give you a watertight anastomosis. And finally, once you have done this, the only thing you have to know is it do now is to close because you have this little part here you close and then you're done. So this is basically the whole procedure. I know that all of you are not urologists, maybe didn't uh, get into all the small details of this operation, but it is, it is a challenging operation in that it is, has a lot of steps. If you do a conduit, it is easier. You, you staple and you isolate only 20 centimeter of intestine. You don't have to do anything, but you do the same type of anastomosis here, and uh, you will then do your your stoma after this. So this is a quicker operation. So this, part, this to do the intestinal work takes approximately 40 minutes or something once you get to use to, to do the stapling and the, and the, the anastomosis between the ureters. So it's quite a fast technique to do. So why, why do you do it? Well, I mean, there are some clearly some disadvantage because it has a longer learning curve and, and longer operating times in the beginning. Now when we look in the Swedish National Registry, we can see that our operation time is as fast with the robot as the national average of a cystectomy, so the, in open cystectomy. So there is actually no difference. But when you start, there will be a difference because you will be slower in the beginning. Uh, you have to think everything through very carefully because it's a very technically demanding. There's a lot of steps to remember and to do in the correct order. Uh, it costs more money, of course, if you want to do uh, the robotic approach, but it's no difference when the extra or intracorporeal, I think, for cost reasons. They will be basically the same price. But there are some advantages. You, ha you don't have to open the abdomen. You have definitely uh, less blood loss and decreased pain. You never have to use uh, uh, any spinal anesthesia or anything like that. Uh, you have much shorter recovery. The patients stay uh, now in, in Stockholm five days in the hospital, which is much shorter than they used to stay. Uh, or, I should say five post-operative days. And also uh, you have less manipulation to the bowel, which we have the sh in, in many patients anyhow, much shorter uh, time where they have the paralytic ileus after this type of surgery. And in fact, in the international uh, consortium, you can see that the, if you look at extra and intracorporeal, there are actually less readmissions in the uh, intracorporeal, less complications, and, and most of the com difference in the uh, complications is actually in the low grade. It's very similar in the high grade, but the low grade complications seem to be less when you do an intracorporeal uh, dissection. And it's mostly gastrointestinal an infectious complication that are less in the intracorporeal group. Okay, thank you very much.